Good morning, my name is Rob Wolford. I'm here with Ken Caldwell. We're going to shoot a video about splitting rails for a split rail fence. One of the first things I want to stress is that you need to always think of safety first because once injured, it doesn't matter how you were injured. One of the very first things you always have to think of are your eyes. I use uh, impact safety glasses. And while well, they're not entirely goggles, they uh, certainly will help shield your eyes from flying fragments. I also use earplugs. In my case, I use a tissue and simply wad up uh, bits of paper, shove that in my ears. That's efficient. Once, of course, I use them, I can throw them away. The pitch of the ring that comes out of um, hitting the wedge with the sledgehammer uh, will damage your hearing. So please always be very careful and mindful of those. The tools that you need for splitting rails are very simple. A sledgehammer and a few wedges. I have also included today a cant hook for turning the log over and positioning it. I have a I have a barking spud for peeling bark. This was a common tool found in most farms in Appalachia. Um, farmers would cut trees, fell them in the summer when there was time, and as the bark began to lose its uh, adhesion to the log, they would use this to peel the bark off and sell to a tannery. I also have a chisel used to split off the fibers that connect one rail to the other after I've split the majority of it. it. Simplifies the work considerably. I have five wedges, one of which is very sharp. The idea is to start the split with a sharp one, pounding it into the smallest end of the log with my sledgehammer and continuing the split down the length of the log. A word about the log is necessary. When you're splitting a log, you always start at the smaller end. And if you have a gradient to where you're splitting it, you want the smaller end uphill. That way you're working with gravity as opposed to against it. You start with the smaller end so that the split that you start, if you go wonky halfway through your log, the larger end will split out with enough wood that it is usable as opposed to uh, having the wane, the grain of the wood, uh, take you out to where you have a very thin end with a large end making your rail utterly useless. Uh, I've got my log set up. This particular log is very straight. It does not have knots in it. It's red oak, so the grain is ideal for splitting. And uh, we have left the bark on it for the rustic look. Most of it will come off while you're splitting. And we'll go ahead and get started. We begin by always putting on our safety equipment, and I'll also begin by driving my sharpest wedge into the end of the log. At a minimum, you have to have two wedges in order to do this. I personally, I have five. Six, including a very large wedge that if my wedge ever got stuck, I could split out to save my other wedges. When we examine this log, one of the things that seems to jump right out at us is a natural crack that does seem to cross rather conveniently and rather evenly across the center, here and here. And I am inclined to use that. However, I want to stress, if the log has knots in it, you need to try to split as best you can between those knots, because knots will take you in directions that, uh, well, frankly, you'll end up with a less than perfect product. We begin by putting on our safety glasses and driving our sharpest wedge into one of the cracks that's already naturally occurring. Rather conveniently, three splits have opened up on this log. This hardly ever happens. And in my years of experience, I think this is the first time it's ever happened. I want to stress this is uh, not typical. As we've opened the splits up, we will now take our second wedge and work further down the log 
continuing the split down the length of the log. Even though we've conveniently had the split start in the log, I'm not entirely comfortable with the one that's on my side of it. It seems to be going in a direction that will cause it to be rather thin at the other end. Uh, for that reason, I'm going to split on the opposing side um, with the expectation of uh, better seeing what I'm getting myself into. I peeled back some of the bark to expose where the crack is. And uh, again, the crack has opened up, so I have a place now to start my wedge. That's a very big problem with this particular log. It has dry rotted. Not all of it, but about uh, 12 inches into the end of it, you have what appears to be uh, degradation of the log, which is typical for logs that have sat outside for a number of years, such as this one. But certainly it's usable. You just have to move further up to get your splits. continued our split, we've gotten past the rotted area, I've moved into much more solid wood fibers, and I've opened my split up, and we've moved up much further, using one of my other wedges, continue the split. As I split the length of the log, wedges that I earlier put in should become loose. As the split opens up, you'll notice that there are tendons or fibers that uh, basically hold the two halves together. Sometimes a hit with your chisel can break them off. But for the more stubborn ones, you'll need to use the wood chisel that I showed you earlier. This is what we call pop. The entire length of the log is now split. And using the barking spud that I showed you earlier, I'll just basically pry the two apart. I'll take my hammer, stick it down in the crack, barking spud, and use the two to pry apart. There's your two halves, and you split them again, and you have four rails. Uh, now that we've split the two apart, you can see pretty easily where the rotted material is. It's the dried out looking uh, material at the end of the log. 
This has been exposed to the weather for about five years. While well seasoned, one of the things that does occur is that the wood will tend to what we call dry rot. At least I call it dry rot. It becomes powdery, it becomes very brittle, and usable for practically nothing. Uh, it does also become a, uh, an area for insect infestation. But as far as using it for rails, the continued use of this log is perfectly appropriate as it'll be exposed to the weather. I'll come up here into more solid material and drive my wedge directly down through the grain here and continue splitting it that way. Uh, splitting up here in this rod of material would be of no real value. So let's get our sharpest wedge and continue to split. The reason you want to drive your wedge into the bark side and not into the flat side is that it's easier to get purchase or to sink your wedge into the material so that it doesn't pop back out at you. It is simply a safety precaution. In this case, I peeled some of the bark away, getting into that softer outer wood so that I can sink my wedge in. When starting a wedge such as this, it's best to start in on an angle with one corner of the wedge. And again, I'm using my sharpest wedge. By leapfrogging your wedges, you can very quickly move down the length of the log. Ultimately, what you're trying to do is create four about uniformly sized lengths of rails for used in building your fence. The rails will not always be uh, the same size, but in planning to build your fence, you should always put your largest rails on the bottom, your smallest rails. When we get to the fence building part of the video, I'll explain why. Now that we have our rail cut, we're ready to put it in place. In my case, I'm replacing some rails in this fence. I'm also making it a little higher to be more historically accurate. When putting a rail on, one of the things you have to do, of course, is uh, get your place that you're going to put it more prepared. I put styles on this fence, which are the uh, more vertical members. I'll take those off and then put this rail where it needs to go. Replacing this one that, uh, while not in bad shape, it is fast fading. Uh, it was made from willow wood, which is twisted, and I know for, uh, from experience that this will soon rot out. It's already partly rotted out. The viewer will immediately notice that the uh, 
rail is much longer than the ones below it. But if you'd remember, the ends were rotted, so I will come back with a chainsaw and cut those rotted ends off, making it to the correct length. To put it, keep it into place, we use styles. Styles are lengths of wood, <coughs> uh, typically larger on one end than the other, that were interlocked between the rails uh, as vertical members, leaned up against to hold the fence in place. Uh, this fence is entirely for aesthetic purposes. Were it a uh, one for fencing and livestock, it would be built much more sturdily. Uh, the timbers would be much more robust. Earlier we mentioned that the larger rails would be the bottom rails and not on the top. Uh, the reason for this was that the heaving, thawing, uh, freezing of the ground would tend to dislodge um, and make more unstable any fence with, uh, that was top heavy, with rails that were heavier on top. During the American Civil War, one of the chief problems that uh, farmers had with foraging armies were, was the destruction of their fences. Not in the sense of vandalism, not in the sense of um, anything that was uh, with malice, but just out of necessity. Soldiers needing to cook their food, uh, to light their campfires, would devour a farmer's fences uh, in a matter of minutes, each man picking up a rail. In the Northern Army, uh, commanders were very specific that only the top rail could be foraged. However, after column, one column after another passing a farmer's fence, grabbing the top rail, soon there was no fence left. The practice was perpetrated by both Southern and Northern armies uh, with much destruction to the footage of fencing throughout the United States. In the South especially, there were practically no split rails fences left following the American Civil War. In lithographs of Romney, uh, early drawings of Romney depict fences, and by the time you get to the lithograph of 1863, no fences exist within the town. Okay, so we put a new rail in. We're going to lock it down with our styles. Basically, we take and put them where the rails cross, leaning them towards the rails. We have gravity do our work. Building a split rail fence, ensure that your bottom rail is sitting on either two rocks or on two rails. It is inherently unstable to have one rail end sitting on a rock and the other on another rail. Uh, you want something that uniformly rises and falls with the thawing and freezing of the ground. Again, reminder. Please put your heaviest rails on the bottom and your lightest rails on top. Thank you.